Hello everyone, welcome to our channel University of Political Science. Today I discusses about what is the role of the monarchy in UK. Monarchy is the oldest form of government in the United Kingdom. In a monarchy, a king or queen is head of state. The British monarchy is known as a constitutional monarchy. This means that, while the sovereign is head of state, the ability to make and pass legislation resides with an elected parliament. Although the sovereign no longer has a political or executive role, he or she continues to play an important part in the life of the nation. The king or queen is advisor. Far more important is the monarch's role as a critic, advisor, and friend of the ministers. In the oft-quoted phrase of Badgett, the sovereign has three rights the type to be consulted, the right to encourage, the right to warn. And a king of great sense and sagacity, he further added, would want no others. He would find that his having no others would enable him to use these with singular effect. Or, as stated by Winston Churchill, under the British constitutional system the sovereign has a right to be made acquainted with everything for which his ministers are responsible, and has an unlimited right of giving counsel to his government. Since the time of George I, the sovereign has not attended a cabinet meeting, but the king is better informed than the average cabinet minister on all matters which are brought before the cabinet. He sees all cabinet papers, whether they are circulated by the cabinet office or by the departments. He receives the cabinet agenda in advance and can discuss memorandum with the ministers responsible for them. If he requires information from a department he can ask for it. He also receives a copy of the cabinet minutes, reports of cabinet committees, including the defense committee and the chiefs of staff committee and the daily print of dispatches circulated by the foreign office. He follows debates in parliament by means of the official report. If other information would be helpful, he can ask his private secretary to obtain it. Moreover, he has a staff to keep him informed of the development of political events. In short, the prime minister must keep the king abreast of what happens within and without the country, always tell him of cabinet decision, and he must be ready to explain the seasons for any policy in some respects, says Jennings, notably on foreign affairs and on matters dealing with the Commonwealth. He may be better informed than the prime minister. The king would, thus, acquire some knowledge and experience which no other statesman in control of governmental machine can claim. Badgett rightly showed that the king has two advantages over the prime minister. One, while prime ministers and ministers change, the king goes on until he dies. Cabinet business, therefore, is continuous for him, and a change of government is merely a change of personnel. All this makes the king a mentor whom a wise minister T.S. not only obliged, but positively desires to consult. In a word, the king knows the mistakes made by a premier's predecessors, and probably why they made them. Writing about the advantages of monarchy, just after the death of George VI, Clemian Atlee said, Yet another advantage is that the monarchy continuously in touch with public affairs, acquires great experience, whereas the prime minister might have been out of office for some years. He, Prime Minister, has no doubt kept himself as fully informed as possible and, on coming into office, can avail himself of the experience of the civil service, but this is not the same thing as having access, year after year, to all the secret papers. King George VI was a very hard worker and read with great care all the state papers that came before him. A Prime Minister discussing affairs of state with him was talking to one who had a wider and more continuous knowledge than anyone else. Since the Prime Minister must discuss his policies with the monarch, speak of new developments, and listen to what he has to say, and what the monarch says is the result of his perennial knowledge and experience, he is in an excellent position to influence the man who has the power to decide on policy. To express a doubt, as Jennings case, is often more helpful than to formulate a criticism, to throw in a casual remark is often more helpful than to write a memorandum. The easy personal relationship that George VI maintained with his ministers probably had more influence than the letters, which Queen Victoria wrote in profusion. John Wheeler Bennett, in his biography of George VI, points out that the king believed, as did his father, that the crown must of necessity represent all that was most straightforward in the national character, 
that the sovereign must set an example to his people of devotion to duty and service to the state, and that, in relation to his ministers, he must closely adhere to and never abandon the three inalienable rights of the king in a constitutional monarchy, the right to be consulted, the right to encourage, and the right to warn. The views of the king are particularly valuable, because they are not clouded by political controversy. He has no party objective at a nor is he concerned with intra-party intrigues. He is in the words of Lord Attlee, the general representative of all the people and stands aloof from the party political battle. The former conservative prime minister Sir Alec Douglas Home was of the opinion that the Queen has a constitutional role of great importance, because after all everything is done in the name of the Queen and Parliament so they are one. I think her power lies in her influence, and the authority which she naturally carries after 25 years of the most intimate experience of national and international affairs thinks she t's influential. Nor that she would take a political part, not at all but obviously the Prime Minister discusses with her political issues of the first importance both to our country and overseas. And on Al. Of those the Queen will have a point of view which is her own, born of very considerable experience. Her influence is important and accepted. I think, because people realize, in this country, that she puts public service above everything, and far above, of course politics in which she does not herself intervene. On the same point Sir Harold Wilson, another former Prime Minister, said, her role is important, not in terms of power, but in terms of, for example, the weekly audience the Prime Minister has with her. These are very useful for the Prime Minister because, for instance, he is talking to an absolute confidence to someone with a lot of experience and a lot of understanding, sometimes a lot of sympathy. He has to collect in his mind all the things he wants to talk about which have happened over the past week, and she will put a lot of questions, always friendly and helpful. It is a very pleasant oasis in a Prime Minister's life and constructive one, then, there is the traditional reverence for the monarch's office which must add weight to his opinions. Asquith wrote in his memorandum on the rights and obligations of the king that he is entitled and bound to give his ministers all relevant information which comes to him, to point out objections which seem to him valid against the course which they advise, to suggest, if he thinks fit, an alternative policy. Such intimations are always received with the utmost respect and considered with more respect and deference than if they proceeded from any other quarter. Jennings gives a matter of fact summing up. He says, thus, the king may be said to be almost a member of the cabinet, and the only non-party member. He is, too, the best informed member, and the only one who cannot be forced to keep silent. His status gives him power to press his view upon the minister making a proposal, and, what is sometimes even more important, to press them on the minister who is not making proposals. He can do more. He can press those views on the prime minister the weight of whose authority may in the end produce the cabinet decision. He can, if he likes to press his point, insist that his views be laid before the cabinet and considered by them. In other words, he can be as helpful or as obstreperous as he pleases in the end, of course, he is bound by a cabinet decision, but he may play a considerable part in the process by which it is reached. The king's function is advisory only. He can press his opinions as forcefully as he likes. He may resist the advice given to him by his ministers, but he must not persist and in the last resort give way if ministers refuse to accept his opinion. He cannot carry his point so far as to threaten the stability of his government. There are two reasons for it. In the first place, the king cannot act unconstitutionally so long as he acts on the advice of a minister supported by a majority in the House of Commons. Ministerial responsibility I is the safeguard of the monarchy. The saying that the king can do no wrong precisely illustrates that the monarch cannot make decisions of a political or controversial character. The price of his popularity and position is in the abstention from politics. In the second place, if the king forces his opinion which the ministers are not willing to accept the cabinet must resign. The king's action, then, immediately enters into political controversy. But the real power of the king depends upon his willingness to keep respectable and to keep off politics. The throne cannot stand for long amid the gusts of political conflict and the storm of political opinion. The road of least criticism is the road for the king. Lord Esher, who was advising George V on the dispute over the Home Rule Bill controversy, 
most correctly summed up the position of the king. He wrote in a memorandum, Every constitutional monarch possesses a dual personality. He may hold and express opinions upon the conduct of his ministers and their measures. He may endeavor to influence their actions. He may delay decisions I in order to give more time for reflection. He may refuse assent to their advice up to the point where he is obliged to choose between accepting it and losing their services. More information please visit our website www.politicalscienceview.com Thanks see again to new topics.